If you've ever studied physics or a particular relativity, you've probably heard someone say that the Michelson-Morley experiment disproved the existence of ether. Well, they were telling you a lie. And we know it's a lie because the quantum field exists, and the quantum field is essentially an ether. I did a video called um, There Is No Ether on that particular lie. Um, and so we know that the Michelson Morley could not have disproven the existence of the quantum field. So when they did the experiment and got the null result, there were two possibilities. Either there is no ether, or the assumption behind the experiment was wrong. And the assumption behind the experiment goes back to a conjecture made by Maxwell in particular. So we know, because the quantum field exists, that Maxwell's conjecture was wrong. And the experiment should have always get the result it got. And this is kind of interesting because since the quantum field exists and it's ether, then everyone who tries to reproduce the Michelson Morley experiment in one form or another is just wasting their time. It's really kind of silly. Anyway, the, I wanted to go back through the evidence for the existence of the quantum field um, that I covered in the previous video. And they are things like the quantum field is polarizable and it's magnetizable, which indicates that it contains electric charges. It also has an electric constant and magnetic constant. Once again, it contains electric and magnetic constants in order for that to be true. And then we have things like the lamp shift, the self energy of an electron, the uh, correction in terms to the G factor, which are based on the self energy of an electron. We have the Casimir effect, one of my favorites, because the Casimir effect is based on van der Waals forces. So the quantum field has van der Waals forces, which requires that it's filled with dipoles. And then we have things like the black body radiation in a vacuum, where the photons are initiated with an interaction with the quantum field, quantum fluctuation. And then we also have a spontaneous emission of atoms. When an atom spontaneously emits a photon, that interaction is uh, triggered by a quantum fluctuation. And then we have um, the dynamical Casimir effect is another case where in the classical thought experiment of a spinning mirror, the quantum fluctuation can gain energy and turn into a photon. And all these, those things have been experimentally determined to exist. And anyone who wants to try to disprove the existence of the quantum field has to come up with an alternative theory for how space behaves like it's filled with these quantum fluctuations that behave like electric charge dipoles and can be converted into photons. The next proof is there's a lack of drag effect in space if we consider planets and stars. If there were a drag effect like imagined by a Maxwell working in one direction, we wouldn't have Newtonian gravitational physics at all. The planets would be in irregular orbits they would become increasingly elliptical and either, until either the object fell into the sun or got diverted out into space. There wouldn't be such thing as stable orbit if there was a continuous ether drag effect working in one direction only. And so we know there isn't a drag effect because there's no effect on planets. And, and it makes no sense to say, well, there's an ether drag effect on light, but not planets. No, it's got to be both or none, and it's none. Um, so it, that whole idea should have been dismissed as nonsense up front. Um, and then we can also go back to, well, what's happening electromagnetically to show that, yeah, light's not affected either. And one of the first things we need to understand that was a mistake in the theory and, and current relativity theory is light travels in the ether restraint. It travels in the quantum field restraint. Light is emitting electric and magnetic fields, or has electromagnetic fields that are propagating through the quantum field. And they form these sine wave structures that we're used to that indicates their constant rotation that is counter-rotating each uh, 180 degrees. And so because the 
the photon is interacting with the quantum field, that's what the quantum, well, that's what the photon sees when it's traveling. So the instant it leaves the source, all it's interacting with is the quantum field. And then when it hits a detector, it hits a detector. So if the source or detector are moving relative to the quantum field rest frame, then you get a, a shift in energy. But the photon never doesn't actually have a way to understand that. Uh, it just travels, when the photon's traveling, it's just traveling through the quantum field. And so that's important because the quantum field in its rest frame is uniform in all directions. It has, so because it's uniform in all directions, the speed of light is uniform in all directions. And the electric and magnetic constant is uniform in all directions. And we have this relationship of the electric and magnetic constant multiplied together equals one over the speed of light squared. And within the quantum field, it's the electric and magnetic constants that are more fundamental. And that comes about because of the electrical properties of the quantum field because they're made of dipoles. The electric constant is related to polarization. The magnetic constant is related to magnetization of the electric charge dipoles. And those are regulated by quantum van der Waals torque. In addition to having the van der Waals forces necessary for the Casimir effect to exist, whenever you have a sea of dipoles, you also have quantum van der Waals torque. And this torque prevents ob these dipoles from rotating or any charged object or any object period from moving through space. It will face resistance because the quantum field dipoles don't want to rotate. They want to stay in their position. And when they do rotate, they cause other quantum dipoles to rotate. So this mutual resistance to rotation causes Van der Waals torque. And so this torque resists all forms of linear and rotational motion in space. And it's this torque that determines what the electric and magnetic constants are. And then the electric and magnetic constants determine what the speed of light is. The speed of light is not an elementary constant. It's a, it's a tertiary constant. Van der Waals forces first, electromagnetic constant second, and then the speed of light. And so this, this mental habit some physicists have of saying, oh, the speed of light is the number one constant. It just magically appears. No, it doesn't appear by magic. The electromagnetic constant cause the speed of light to be what it is. And they're caused by the quantum field and the torque of the quantum field in particular. So then we can consider the experiment. Okay, you have an experiment that is moving relative to the quantum field rest rate, but you have one source and one detector. Even though the photons are split into two beams, and if you're not familiar with the setup for the Michelson Morley experiment, you can find it on a number of sites on, uh, if you Google it. So anyway, you have the same source and the same detector, and you have a, a beam split. The path links are fixed, they're not moving. If the path links did move, then you would, of course, have friendships. We, we know that from numerous other experiments. But if you have fixed path links, you don't get friendships, and which is what the Michelson-Morley experiment showed. So there's nothing in the experiment that would show any sort of relativistic effect because you have an, an entire apparatus that's moving in a rest frame, or a reference frame relative to the rest frame at a cons consistent uh, velocity. Now it's a little bit tricky because the Earth is rotating, so you're dealing with a rotating rest frame, but uh, those details aside, the motion is, is regular, and we shouldn't expect to see any type of uh, differences due to relativistic changes within the apparatus itself because it's dimensionally fixed. Um, so, but when you do have a moving rest frame or an object in a moving rest frame, the observers from that rest frame would see rotation in the quantum field. That as an object moves and you move back past 
dipoles in space, the dipoles will appear like they're moving, even though in the rest frame they may not be moving. And that's just a observer effect. But that observer effect leads to uh, an apparent increase in the quantum grain of Wall's torque. An increase in the quantum grain of Wall's torque is, causes the electric and magnetic constants to increase, which causes the speed of light to be reduced. And it also reduces the speed of physical clocks. But because the speed of light and physical clocks changes together, the actual speed of light appears to be unchanged. But in terms of this experiment, the quantum van der Waals torque is uniform in space and it does not have a directional dependence. So the electric and magnetic constants don't have a directional dependence, and the speed of light doesn't have a directional dependence. And that's how electromagnetically the Maxwell's conjecture was totally wrong. There's just no directional dependence because the quantum field's torque and electromagnetic constants don't have a directional dependence. And they're what determines the speed of light. The speed of light is not some magical proper property that's fixed and can be changed due to geometric considerations alone. Whenever you want to see what's happening with the speed of light, you have to go back to the question of what's happening to the electric and magnetic constant, the permittivity and permeability of space. And so that's why Maxwell's conjecture is wrong, and that's why it's a lie if someone says michelson morley experiment uh, disproved the existence of ether. Um, and as I said at the beginning, we know the quantum field exists. The evidence right now is, is undeniable. And so, and, it, and it's an ether in all respects because it, and a luminiferous ether as well. If the quantum field didn't exist, light would not exist because it would have nothing to interact with. And so we, we have a case where the physicists were just wrong and they've been wrong <laughs> now for uh, 130 plus years. Um, and they should have realized immediately that it was wrong, as I said, because the Earth hasn't fallen into the sun because of this ether drag effect. There's no ether drag effect. There never was an ether drag effect, and we will never see it. Uh, if there's a small quantum ether drag effect at, at the most smallest possible level, it's going to be unmeasurable. So anyway, um, if you have someone, a teacher, or if you're watching a video and someone says the Michelson Morley experiment disproved the existence of ether, you can tell that person they're lying because the quantum field exists. So the Michelson Morley experiment didn't disprove anything. And so, anyway, um, I hope you liked the video. And if you did, please like, share, subscribe. And if you're interested in quantum field theory, my expertise. Uh, you can watch more of my videos as they come out or some of the previous ones I've made. And then I have some books that I've written about some of my research and so you could buy one of those and learn more that way as well. And I am an independent research so I have a Patreon account and if you're interested in supporting my research I, I really appreciate it. So thank you very much for watching.